and they begin with the inhibitory system that begins when you are born. The inhibitory system is what makes you stuff. It just inhibits you. That's what it does. So you can see with babies, there's no inhibitory system it, 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 when they're born. They cry when they're unhappy. They're fine when they're not. I mean, you know exactly how they're feeling, what they're doing all the time, because they can't suppress anything. And you watch it develop over time. The next executive function is working memory. Working memory is very brief. There are many different kinds of memory, but working memory is 30 seconds or less. It's what we use all the time, all day long, to remember something. So if you could think of your brain as storage cabinets, working memory is up here in this frontal lobe. So if your cabinets are like this, this is your very long-term memory, you know, middle memory, coming all the way up. So your working memory is what is what you have heard just now in 30 seconds. Your brain will then decide, is that important for me to know or not? And when it's all, yeah, I think that's important. What will happen is it'll start to store. If not, it'll toss it away. And I'll go through more examples of this, but for now I just want you to know it's 30 seconds or less. Next to develop, between six to eight years of age, is to internalize speech. So that is when you are able to talk to yourself in your head really well. So when you had your little kids, you remember how you continued to talk them through things? And then pretty soon what you started to notice is that they could go through the motions and they were talking themselves through it in their heads. The third executive function, fourth executive function is self-regulation of affect, and that's emotional self-control. That is where the lion's share of the research is right now because it is so important, and we're going to go into that in great detail as well. That's around middle school. These, you know, these ages are rough, but around middle school, which is why they call middle school kind of that uh, tumultuous time for kids. And then any time between 16 years and on, we have what we call reconstitution. And reconstitution is taking things apart, and putting them back together in a new and novel way. And we'll talk about that. That's what high school is trying to do to prepare you to go to college. You're supposed to be analytically thinking now. Take it, you hear what you have in your lessons and then put it together in a new and novel way. These executive functions take up to 30 years to develop. So in your time with your student, you know, your kids are in high school. So you can kind of start thinking, where are they on this? You know, have they reached reconstitution? How are they at regulating their effect? But start thinking about these, because they go in order. Uh, you can't skip around. So they, and you will see, you have to inhibit to let your working memory come online, to let your self-speech tell you what to do, to regulate either motivation or mood or being objective, to move forward into now analytical higher level thinking. So that's how it works. One, two, three, four, five. And what my goal is tonight is that you have an overview of this so that you can begin thinking about as an executive function parent. So when a problem arises or an issue, instead of thinking, what do I do, this becomes kind of your roadmap to, oh, OK, I need to work on working memory. This kid's forgetting stuff. I need to work on, oh, they're not controlling their emotions so well. They're too anxious about this. Well, now I have a template for how to help my child orchestrate this. So in, in many ways, what happens is you become, as parents, uh, kind of their executive functions for them. So as parents, you're going to be teaching executive functions and then also helping guide them when they're not there. So they're developmental <coughs> across time, as we said. They are responsible for managing your IQ. They are also how we manage our day-to-day -day life. So let me say a little bit more about responsible for managing our IQ. I have phone calls from parents all the time that say, I have this really bright, wonderful student, but they're not doing very well in school. But I know they're bright. Well, what's typically happening when a parent says that to me, aside from perhaps a learning disability, which is not what I'm talking about, is that they're not able to access their executive functions well enough to then support that raw base IQ that they have. So people talk about IQ as important, but it is. But frankly, executive functions are more important. I've seen students with snapping executive functions whose IQs were not that high do extremely well because those executive functions were so efficient. I've seen uh, the reverse. I've seen students who are quite bright who can't seem to be successful because they can't access their executive functions to support that IQ. So we're looking at both when we look at our students. And every student that goes to Groves, I believe, gets a very good assessment here. So you have some knowledge of what that is and what you want, is you want these working together. 
And that's what's exciting about the class, is that not only are you guys getting the knowledge, but your students are. Because that's where we want them to be in high schools, taking ownership of their executive functions so that when they graduate, they're ready to be successful on their own. And that's what we all want. So for those of you who have a student with ADHD, I put this slide in here. This is not an ADHD talk. However, if you do have a student with ADHD, with ADHD what I want you to know <coughs> is that ADHD is actually a delay of executive function. That's what that condition <coughs> is, okay? And so if your student does have ADHD, we will talk a lot more about that slide. Not tonight, in an, but you would be looking at the delay. And this is the average delay. So for those of you with high school students who have that diagnosis between 15 and 18, your executive functions may be lagging at 10 to 12 years old, which may be why you feel like you're having to step in more than you feel that you should. And when that, but notice that delay means younger but normal, okay? Mm -hmm. Their brains are coming along, but the pace is so much slower. Um, again, not related to IQ, but where you see it as an adaptive functioning, that getting up, going to school, managing their homework on their own, you know, knowing what they're doing, you'll see that delay there. Um, I give that to you, and if anybody has more questions about that, because we're not really going to be addressing the delay right now, um, you've got my email, so just email me if you have questions. Okay, so the goal is for you folks as parents to be an executive function parent. So what does that mean? That means you understand brain development, that you recognize which executive function needs support <coughs> and teaching and monitoring, <coughs> that you don't take personally when your child has these difficulties, because it's about the brain. It's not about them being disobedient. It's not about, it's not that you're not doing a good job. It is simply that our executive function isn't working. It helps you to remain emotionally calm when you understand this because it separates <coughs> what's going on from the person. So you can look at your wonderful kid who a, has great character and all the wonderful traits that they have, but then when they struggle, you can go, oh, okay, that's the executive function. And so you can make that separation, which is really helpful in being a parent and not becoming frustrated. It maintains a healthy perspective and it helps you be more effective your parenting will be much more effective. So as a parent, when an issue comes up, you have a couple choices here. Depending on what it is, you're gonna ask yourself, is it a skill deficit? Is the problem because my student doesn't know how to do this? And if they don't know how to do this, then you have to teach the skill and monitor it. You can't ask them to do something they don't know. So is it a skill deficit? You go to this pyramid. If you go over here as a parent and it's a performance deficit, they know how to do this. They're just not, okay? So it isn't that you need to teach it anymore. It's that they're not doing performing. So let me give you an example. Assignment notebooks, okay? I would bet that every kid in high school has had instruction on how to fill out an assignment notebook, right? And they know that they should do that. But let's say this student isn't doing that. It's coming home blank. So it isn't that they don't know how to do it, it's that they're not doing it. So now we've got a problem. The problem is who or what's gonna change? So either the person has to change and go, okay, I'm really gonna take on this assignment notebook and I'm gonna figure out how to use it effectively, using my executive functions to do that. Or if I've got a kid who goes, you know, assignment notebooks just don't work for me. They never worked for me. I, they're just not gonna work. And then my response could be back to that student who I know knows how to fill out an assignment notebook. It's going to be, well, I wonder where we can find a school where you don't need that knowledge. Where can we go to school where you don't need to fill out an assignment notebook? And if they look at you and go, well, school I'm going to make you do it, then I'm saying, well, either you have to change or the environment, the environment you're in is not changing. So now we've got the issue is you've got to change. And I think this is a really important point because I think a lot of students that I have seen in the past have been to many professionals. And the pro they're trying to find ways to help this person be successful not doing what they know. Well, you know, that's not just not going to work and it's not life. So when you can explain to this person that some of the things that you're not doing, that you know how to do, and you're not doing them, we can't find an environment where that works. So let's talk about that. And that can open the discussion to what we're going to do 
and get them to buy into the fact that they have to change. Anybody, is that understandable? Because I think that's really important. Because I've got a lot of kids thinking, well, we're just going to keep going to people until we find out you know, that my life gets easier. Well, no, actually, you're going to change. All right, so we're going to start with the inhibitory system. Okay, so that's the first executive function. It stops your first response in behavior or speech. Okay, so remember, executive functions is not about IQ or a deficit in knowledge. So all kids know how to speak respectfully. I know that because I see them all the time. However, they may not stop in the moment, inhibit, and go, oh, that's not the right thing to say, and out blurts something inappropriate, disrespectful, shouldn't have been said. Okay? So that's an example of the inhibitory system not catching what this person was going to say. Um, we're going to talk about this later, but what you do is you simply re-ask the question. You say, you know what? I'm going to give you a second chance on that. That right there is enough to, that pause that you gave is enough for that person then to change their answer. If they change their answer to what is respectful or what should have been said, you know that they've caught it. And they've given you the knowledge or the information that you wanted. Um, and then you let it go. You let it go. But you have to set this up with your student first. So you can say, when you say something that I think is going to be disrespectful or get you in trouble, I'm going to give you a quick second chance. If you correct it, we're good. If you don't, that is how you tell the difference as a parent, whether this is a person just being disrespectful, they intend to be disrespectful because they've repeated it twice, or <laughs> You know, whatever they've said that's not right. So you can tell the difference in whether it's an executive function deficit or if they're really being, the, you know, obstinate. The same is true of behavior. So you can act without thinking if you don't pause. So we all have been, you've been great parents. I'm sure you've taught your students for appropriate ways to behave in different situations. However, if they don't do that, that's because they haven't used the knowledge they've got. Okay, so oftentimes we have to remind them immediately before something to go, it's before it becomes a habit, that uh, this is what, the, what we're supposed to do now. Otherwise, they could just do whatever. The second thing it does is stop an ongoing response even when the end result is not what you wanted. So that is why it's so hard. So all of us by nature are pleasure seekers. That's normal. We all just want to spend our time doing exactly what we enjoy. The only reason we don't is because we inhibit. And we go, uh, can't keep doing this now. I gotta stop watching, you know, Netflix. And I've got to go, you know, in our case, make dinner or whatever it is we have to do or prepare for tomorrow. Our inhibitory system and our executive functions make us stop that fun to go do the, another task, particularly a boring, icky task. So even though you can ask your student what their intentions are, and I always, and I, they have a trouble following through on their good intentions, that's what I say, because they can tell you what it is that they plan to do. But if they get engaged in something that's truly enjoyable, depending on where they are developmentally, they may have a very difficult time pulling them off that to go to do this boring task. And as parents, I'm sure you have been their inhibitory system, right? So you've walked in and said, it's time to turn off Netflix. Time to do this, time to do that. You need to stop that. And basically, you are being the inhibitory system when you do that. So one of the things we have to do is teach our kids how to do this. It stops outside distractions from interfering with the task at hand. Every single one of us, no matter where we are, when our minds will wander. That is normal for our minds to wander, OK? But we have to pull them back. So if you're sitting here and I am boring you, your mind's going to wander to something else. But if I'm good at what I do, I will have a zinger for you to bring you all back, OK? But also, you will have to do that. And you can even watch the little kids when they're doing this. They'll actually shake their heads. They'll kind of go like this. And when they're in first, second grade, and kind of come back to the teacher. So outside distractions interfere with everyone. It's how easily you pull yourself back. That is neurologically, by the way, can be practiced, and we're going to talk about that, so that you can get better at this. Instead of being at the mercy, well, I just can't pay attention. Okay? We can do this. So the inhibitory system is the brakes of your brain. That's what it is. And you can watch it in your kids. When, they aren't, when the brakes don't turn on, all kinds of things don't happen. Working memory begins at birth as well, and it's 30 seconds or less. 
So you have seen this a million times, I'm sure, at home. So hold a thought, okay? For 30 seconds, you gotta hold a thought. So you walk into your student's room and you tell them that dinner is in five minutes. And that goes right there to that working memory. <coughs> and because the brain goes, gosh, I don't really need to remember that the rest of my life. That's not that important. Okay, the brain does that, boom, it's gone. So they don't show up for dinner. You have to go back and you say, Dinner is ready. You know, I told you it's in five minutes. We're waiting for you. <gasps> oh, yes. I'm coming right now. And they mean that. But it's the first time they thought of it again. They didn't hold it all the way through or start wrapping up what they were doing right after you <coughs> left to prepare to come for dinner. So <coughs> thought can get them in a lot of trouble because they don't, thought, they don't do what they said they were going to do right then and there. It also is when you return to an, uh, an interrupted task. So if I'm a student and I'm sitting at the kitchen table doing my homework and the doorbell rings, I go and answer it and it's UPS who's got a package and I take the package and oh that's interesting and I start thinking about the package and then I take it and I come find whoever your parent and give it to you. Now about five minutes has passed. I kind of forgot that I'm supposed to go back and do some homework. So I might just wander off into my room and start doing something else and it's not because I don't know I'm supposed to do it. I totally just forgot. You know, I'm done. I've been interrupted from my task, and therefore, don't go back to it. Um, you can also see it in note taking. Taking notes in class is very working memory intensive. Mm -hmm. While somebody is talking to you, aren't you thrilled you have these PowerPoints? Mm -hmm. Can you imagine trying to write down everything I'm saying? It would overwhelm your mem memory, and you couldn't get it done. So, no, when you see an accommodation of notes besides <coughs> dysgraphia, often it's because it's too hard to get it all down with somebody that's having working memory problems to get it down. It's not that they can physically take notes, it's coming too fast. And you can see that sometimes students who didn't need notes previously, when they get to college and it really starts to get lecture intensive, um, then they do need them. So just kind of watch for that. So I always look at kids' notes to see how they're doing. Imitation. Imitation is watching somebody do something and then immediately performing it afterwards. So if a kid is in a class, and the teacher's going through and explaining steps of a math problem or a science experiment, and even though they're spot on, listening to every second of it, now it's time to do it. And that do it is more than 30 seconds away. And so I can go, huh, I can't remember how to get started, or I get them out of sequence. What we do is we teach our kids to make checklists. So the second anybody says, I have, a, I'd like, to, let's say you're at home on Saturday and say, I've got four, four or five things I need you to do while I run errands. Mm -hmm. Do not verbally expect them, if you give them to them, to have performed them all when you get back. Because their working memory is going to drop them. They're going to either drop the first one or they'll hold on to the second one, but they won't keep all five of them. So checklists are the front. They're their front. Hindsight forethought. This one is so important. Hindsight, hindsight forethought is about consequences driving your behavior. Okay, let's think about how that works. You make a mistake in your past. We sit down and we figure out what to do so that mistake doesn't happen again. And then I have to perform in the future the next time that situation occurs where I have to correct my mistake. Okay, the longer the time gap is between that, the less chance I'm gonna have of correcting that mistake. I'll repeat it. So, we talk a lot about point of performance uh, reminders, and this would be where you would do that. So if you have a student that you want, you say, on school days, you need to make your bed. That's really important. Weekends, I don't care so much, but I want you to make your bed in the morning before you go to school. And your child, because really they're nice people, go, yes, okay, no problem. And the next day, you go and the bed's not made. Okay, you already see now as executive function parents where the flaw was, don't you? There's no point of performance reminder to help this kid remember the next morning, which is many, many hours away, that that's what they agreed to. So now we're starting to understand how this time things works. How do we help them follow through and let their hindsight and forethought bridge that time gap so that they can, so the consequences um, are positive, okay? I do follow through. What happens is if a lot of times with these students with executive function difficulties, if we say the consequence, they just have to live with the consequence, that will be their teacher. 
Anybody that's got a kid with executive prompt knows that that doesn't work. They just keep repeating it. They start even taking the punishment if that's what it's about because they know they screwed up. <coughs> they just never had a tool to figure out how to make this brain work of theirs. So now we do know we're going to give point of performance reminders. We know that the larger the gap is, the less chance this kid's going to be able to perform. We're going to help them with this while they learn to do it for themselves. Anticipation, time management, and self-awareness are <coughs> all about the concept of time. This is probably, I'd say, the most important piece of all of the executive functions <coughs> in detail of it. And here it is. So time management is developmental. It depends on how old you are, how far out into the future you can think. So in kindergarten, it's a half a day. Look where your kids are, 9 through 12, 6 to 8 days. This is typical. Look where we are, 8 to 15 weeks. So our kids always feel like we're pushing them into the future, and we're trying to figure out why they can't get there. Okay, That is why. This causes more arguments in homes than anything. And because they're young people, we have to understand this and be in their timeline, right? So now that we understand my kids in a six to eight day world, I'm not gonna give them a task or a reward that's a month down the road. That's just not gonna work. They can't persist over time like that, like we could. Now there's some tricks to doing that, but we can't expect it on their own. So I've talked about this. You get an event, the response and the outcome. The bigger that is, the more structure it's going to need. Okay, so that's with any long-term project, anything that you've got going on at home, if they're working on a, you know, whatever. The bigger the time gap. Remember, their kid, your kid is, you know, six to eight days. If it gets past that, we got to start breaking it down into those tasks. And I've seen kids with a timeline as short as one day. So, you know, they weren't <coughs> on this continuum of six to eight days. They were every day. So we had to break it down like that. Self-regulation, oopsie, window on time, looking for, self-regulation, where it is, huh, okay, I gotta look at the slide, this looks out of order. This is, it's the same here. Is it? Okay. Yeah. So the next executive function, hang on. I think you just have the two slides switched. Window on time, okay, okay internalization of speech, we're gonna skip forward. That's the next one. They're out, of, they're out of order. Okay, internalization of speech is six to eight years of age. Description and reflection. That's talking to yourself in your head, okay? So all of you have asked your student, how was your day at school? And the response is, fine. Okay? <laughs> well, what did you do? I mean, it's just like pulling teeth to get them to talk. Okay? But you ask your child about something they like, yak, 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 yak. They'll talk your head off. So you, that's what you're seeing, that I can talk about things I like, but when it's boring, I don't really want to do that so much. But where it comes in academically is written expression. You've got to have a lot of words in your head to get them on that paper to start writing. And so we work, and your teachers will be working with them on written expression to get the, you've heard, I've heard a lot of people say, oh, my kid has all these great ideas, but it's getting them on the paper. And so you've got to get the words out and then organize them to do that. Same is true with um, verbal fluency and talking to them about it. You want to say, you know what, we're going to work on this. I want you to talk about school. I want to hear about it because it's going to help your brain grow so that you can talk, converse about anything, not just stuff that you, know, you find really interesting. In order to follow rules, you have to remember them. So think about how that works. You have to inhibit, pull into your working memory, whatever the rule is, and then say it to yourself to follow. If that process doesn't happen, I can break a rule. So, our kids know they're not supposed to talk in class. They know that they're not supposed to speed when they're driving. I mean, again, they have all the knowledge, but they might break rules because of this process. Again, we're gonna talk about, there's a slide on how we are gonna address that. Problem solving. Okay, here's the, we, they all know the steps of problem solving. They've been taught to define the problem, brainstorm solutions, pick one, do one. What I'm going to ask you to do as parents, as executive function parents, is they're used to us talking to them about doing this. So let's sit down, you have a problem, let's step through it. I'm going to, they don't realize that you guys all have problems and you do this all the time in your head. I'm going to ask you to externalize that and use that as a teaching tool so that you can say to your student, you know what, do you have just a second, Johnny? I got something I want to ask you. I have a problem and here's the deal. 
I'm meeting all my friends from college. We do it once a year on Friday for lunch, and I'm so excited about it. Remember how I do that? I say yes. And you say, but I broke a tooth last night, and the only time I can get into the dentist is at Friday, and it conflicts. What would you do? And you ask your kid what they do. And your kid will tell you. And you're probably going to go to lunch. And, they will, and your kid is going to say, well, you know, it's not in the front. It's not ugly. And you know, you're not in pain. And you could probably be on a cancellation list. But you're going to hear all those brainstorming of solutions. And then you can say, oh, thank you. Great. I'll let you know what I decide. When you do these kinds of things, a couple things happen. Your kids start to learn that, you know what, they're just like me. And it feels respectful to them that you're asking for their choice or their opinion. And then when you have to go through it with them, it feels better. So it feels like you're a problem-solving family, not just you <coughs> have a problem, we're going to sit down and solve it. So I encourage you to use yourself with your students to teach problem-solving. Reading comprehension. From an executive standpoint, executive function standpoint, we have to hold right up here in that 30 seconds the grouping of words in that sentence or paragraph in order to make sense of them. And if we don't, you can see students who will read pages in books and they have no idea what they read. They read every word, but they didn't hold them together. Your teachers are going to be teaching them some wonderful techniques for doing this. There are wonderful techniques to help them, but basically what you do is you're going to slow it down, you're going to write it down. And when you do, your reading comprehension will go right up. Moral reasoning. Okay, <coughs> these kids have great morals. I have yet to work with a kid that I thought was evil. They're wonderful <laughs> people. But they can lie, okay? And they can do some things that we would consider morally wrong. And it's not necessarily because they don't have good morals or character, they all do. But lying is an interesting thing. Uh, sometimes it's impulsive. I'm just saying it. You know, they don't want to let it and then I don't know how to correct it because it's out my mouth now. Sometimes it's also because it buys them time. So if there's different reasons kids will not tell the truth. But what I encourage you to do is I is let your kid always tell you the truth, even when you know it's not what you want to hear. And so I encourage the kids that I work with tell your parents the truth. It, you may have a consequence for it. It, it isn't what they want to hear. But by doing that, you build trust in your family. You cannot have a relationship with anybody that you don't trust or that wants you. And so the goal is we're going to work together in a trusted relationship. We have to be okay with hearing things that we don't want to hear. And then we also have to work it out in ways that um, our kids will tell us the truth over and over again, even though it might not be what you want to hear. And then you have a, a chance to negotiate with them to talk about it. But if they lie to you and we aren't open to hearing it, then they just will keep it going. And I've worked with a ton of kids. And, and you know, some of it happens with homework too. Did you get that done? And they'll say yes. But the truth of it is, they either forgot something, they're too embarrassed to admit it, to all kinds of things like that. So anyway, keep the dialogue going with speech. All right. Now we're going to go back to self-regulation of effect, which is actually the third executive function. Okay, that happens between 10 and 13 years. It is essentially emotional self-control, the ability to be objective, and then motivation. Okay, motivation after time management for me is the second most important skill we teach of these executive functions. So let's start though, with emotional self-control. Unless we have chemical imbalance, which is possible, of course, and we treat that with medication. Otherwise, we control our emotions with our executive functions. So we take in a situation, we inhibit, take it in, pull up in our memory what works best in this situation, upsetting or frustrating or happy or joyful. We talk ourselves through what would be a good response and then we act on it. That's how it works. And so that's why we always talk about therapy being so important in conjunction with medication. Because the medication is very helpful if a child needs that for handling the chemical imbalance. But it never teaches the skill if you don't go to therapy or learn how to do this. And I think it's very powerful that our kids understand we are the boss of our brain. We can, what we tell ourselves actually becomes true. And there's a lot of neurological evidence to say that. So we want to talk about our emotions a lot. 
And as parents, I'm sure as you've raised your children, you have talked their emotions through many times to help them get to a better place. Okay, what we're watching for then is for them to take that on themselves so that they can get to the better, hopeful, positive place without you. And so you always are gonna be paying attention to their emotional self-control. One thing I think it's important for parents to do is when there's a situation that comes up that is very upsetting to your child, because a lot of kids um, whose emotion, their executive functions are lagging, you will see these big swings in their emotions because they're not age appropriate at handling them yet. And so you always want to kind of be thinking, should I be talking them through this? You know, how am I going to help them with it? Because they may not be doing this on their own yet. So pay attention to that. Um, objectivity. Objectivity is making healthy choices. So we've all been told in the past, you know, when you're making a, a choice, that you're going to do a pro and con list. Here's my dilemma, pro and con, make the list. That'll kind of come reveal to me what would be the right thing for me to do. With our students, I do fact and feeling. Because what are the facts about this? But our kids at this age are so emotional. They are so driven by how they feel at this point. They have a harder time suppressing that, that they will tend to do more what they feel than what the facts of the matter or the situation are. An example I would give of that is college. I have had multiple students that I've helped with college, and I'll say, what do you want to study? And they'll say, I want to study architecture. And I'll say, great, come back next week with four or five schools that you think are good schools for architecture that would be a good fit for you. And the next week they come back and I hear Colorado College, University of Colorado, University of Vermont, Westminster in Utah. And I'll go, wow, that's all over the place. Tell me what those schools, what, tell me what you learned. Well, I want to ski. <laughs> okay? That is not that being on the, you know, the feeling side of it. So have them do fact and feelings. That'll help them because their feelings are so strong at this point that they really are players in their decisions, more so than they might be for us. Motivation. Motivation is a skill that needs to be taught. When I ask students what motivation is, most of them will tell me to try hard because they probably need to be motivated to do whatever it is. Okay, it isn't try hard. They're already trying. What it is, is it's a, it's a set of skills that we have. So, I have a slide down here. But basically, what happens is, motivation is only needed for a boring task. You don't need motivation to go do something wonderful. You just go do it. But motivation is something that you can say to a parent, or to a boss, or to a teacher, given a task. And so if the task is, you have a book report due in three weeks, and you know that because you are aware that they have a book report in three weeks, and you say, well, what do you plan? Tell me how you're going to do this. And you are looking for them to give you a plan. Now, it's due in three weeks. We already know about time management, right? It's not on the radar screen yet. Right? So it's like, well, I don't really need to think about that. Well, we think you do. Well, I think you do too, because you can't get it all done in three weeks. So motivation is, why am I going to do this? What do I get for it? Who helps me if I get stuck? <coughs> what are the resources available to me? How much time do I have to get it done? And is it possible, based on my schedule, to accept this task? Now, as a student, of course, they're going to accept it. But in our world, we might say no. You know. And then you have to be able to demonstrate that. And so your students are going to be learning how to demonstrate motivation. So you should hopefully be hearing a student come home and say, I have a book report due in three weeks. I need to pick my book out by Wednesday. After Wednesday and I pick my book out, I need a week to read my book. After I read my book for a week, I'm going to write an outline. On, it take two days to do that. Then I need a rough, and they're going to go through all of this. And at the end, they're going to say, I hope to get a good grade on this because it's 40% of my grade. And so now you know what the motivation is for to doing this. And then as a parent, you're going to be able to say, how can I help you? What helps you persist? This is three weeks. I can see that that could get long. And then you, can, you know what the plan is. But the most important question to that plan is, if I see you not following your plan, how do you want me to help you? What would you like me to do? And it's interesting to hear what they say, because all of the students I see can tell their parents how they really would like to nudge them along. So you ask permission, what would you like me to do? And some of them will say, oh, keep me on track by reminding me every day. Some will say, yell at me. Some will say, be nice to me. But they'll all say something, because then they give you permission for how you're going to do this. 
Okay, reconstitution. The last executive function is analyzing and synthesizing information. So taking things apart and putting them back together. It's verbal fluency, being able to say what you need to say precisely and succinctly. It's inference, how to draw on past experiences, be in a new experience, and know what should work. It is vicarious learning. I can now watch other people and decide whether or not that's going to work for me, what you're doing. And then uh, generating new ideas. And so we call this the playground. Hmm. Those are the executive functions fast, okay? Each of these can be broken down into so many more uh, facets and techniques and things that you can do with them. And that's the exciting thing about your students. That's what they're going to be learning this year. And now we're going to talk about neuroplasticity because the trick is we now know that we can grow our brains, that we can, we're not stuck necessarily with what we're born with all the time. And particularly in executive functions, that is true. These are skills that can be learned and practiced. So this is the brain at birth. You can see that there aren't a lot of neural pathways or connections of knowledge. You can see what happens at six years old, tons of them, because they've learned so much. And then you look at 14, there's fewer. And the reason there's fewer is what you don't use and what you don't practice doesn't grow. It actually dissolves and goes away. So what does that mean to us? We can design our brain to some degree. So anything that's not being practiced is not generating a neural pathway or getting any better. It typically takes 144 days to create a strong neural pathway. That means every day for 144 days, you know, you hear about structure and routine and habits, that's what this is. Once you get to that ballpark, it's just part of what you do. So here's the question. What is my child not doing and needs to be doing? And that's the question I'll ask the student. What are you not doing that you believe you need to be doing? What do you think? And we'll find out. So whatever they say, and then of course this is for you, because this is what, what gets them out of your house. They've got to be doing these things to be you know, adults down the road. That you're you wanting to teach them the skills. You are their teachers. And the problem is, as adults of adolescents, oftentimes you're the last person they want to hear from. Right? And that puts people at this. So by that's the exciting thing about this class. Because your kids are learning this in school, you're going to be learning it outside of, you know, so that you know what they're talking about. And the goal is that you guys can use this as families together to get rid of the conflict, because these are facts. This is research-based. That's all there is to it. They can't blame anybody for the way the brain's put together. It is the way it is. But so now we can work together to get you ready for whatever your great goals are in life, whatever you want to do. So you ask that question. They need to ask that question of themselves. And then we're on the road to building it. So repetition builds neural pathways. And here is one that is essential. Effort equals learning. No effort, no learning. So that's where you gotta watch it with time management and computers, because you can push a button on a repeat um, task every Monday at six o'clock and push that button and it shows up for the year, okay? Every Monday at six o'clock. How much effort did that involve? Zero, okay? So we have really got to watch that what we're trying to teach requires effort. It's the effort that makes it stick and builds the neural pathway. Now I'm going to quickly go through strategies. So I know I'm talking fast. I knew you would be <laughs> zoomed or overwhelmed, but I only have an hour. So inhibitory system strategies. We're going to now talk about mindfulness, which is another thing your students are going to be learning. One of the most exciting things I have seen in the research in the 20 plus years I've been doing this is the research on mindfulness. I am a skeptic and I read research. I don't teach anything that isn't based in research. So when I started seeing that mindfulness fixed everything, you know, it fixed, you know, it helped with pain management and anxiety and heart conditions and uh, depression. And then the next thing I know, I'm reading in the ADHD literature and in the executive function literature, that it's mindfulness. And I'm like, oh, give me a break. This can't possibly be. Well, let me tell you, I've done the research. It works. And that is exciting. It is really exciting. And what's exciting about it is, here's your definition. You can read that. Here's the one I like better. <laughs> mindfulness is a mental state of consistent and flexible attention to the present moment with a non-judgmental attitude and with curiosity, openness, and acceptance. That's the one I like. There's a million of them. And John kabat is kind of the founder of this, so I gave you his and I thought I should. But I like that because it kind of embodies everything that will be happening. So for the inhibitory system, in mindfulness, the first step in the practice is 
taking a deep breath. So before you begin a practice of mindfulness, you go, guess what that does? It turns on the inhibitory system. That's why it works. That's why it works. It works because you stop. And once you stop, you set up that inhibitory system. <coughs> so one of the things they take practice is the stop practice. And I have little stop signs made, and we put them around people's houses so that they start practicing stopping. So you stop, you take a deep breath, you observe the present moment, you proceed with what is my intention, is my behavior what I intended, is this the, is what my thoughts and feelings, are they helpful to me, or are they not? And now you have choice. Well, no, they're not helpful, forget it. Or yes, they're very helpful. <coughs> so we begin to manage the inhibitory system by learning how to practice mindfulness. And they're going to be practicing that in their class. Other strategies besides mindfulness are give a quick second chance, I talked about that. Provide structured routine so you get to the point that 144 days where you do it without thinking. You don't have to stop and think. Um, you help them follow through by putting point of performance reminders. So I talk about these a lot. This helps you follow through, it helps when you're working, memories poor, whatever it is. Um, I know a kid is getting it in my office when I say, I need you next week to bring such and such. Now, clearly, I could manage that for them by saying, I'll send you a text. I will do, I mean, I could be their executive function. What I'm waiting for them is to either pull out their phone or pull out some notebook that they have keep, keep things in and write it down. If they've made a point of performance reminder, pull out my phone, set an alarm, it's going to ding me the morning before I come to see you, and it's going to tell me exactly what I'm going to bring. That's a point of performance reminder. Post-it notes are the best in the world. Anything that's not in your routine should be on a post-it note so that you've got it and then when you're done, you toss it. But you're dumping your mind, you're externalizing that, uh, uh, what you need to do. You can monitor your attention by increasing your awareness of a skill and actively tracking how long um, they can tend before they need a break. So you can watch your kids how long they're doing stuff and you can start to see when they quit. That's kind of the, your kid's timeline. You can kind of figure out what that is too. Working memory strategies, checklists, cell phone reminders, emails, texts, create structure and routine. We talk about the habits again. This is how, why we return to tasks. Okay, if they don't, I've got wonderful examples of this, but don't have time to give them all to you. But you have seen this. They have started working on something and then they wander off because something has interrupted that train of thought. <coughs> so we've learned to do this. We've started to build that skill so that you complete tasks. And you do that by you break these skills down and you're going to teach them one at a time. Your school's going to be teaching them, which is beautiful. So all you have to do is look at, watch what follow their curriculum. And then you can, at home, be helpful in that too. And then, of course, the whole goal is that by the time they're graduating, they're doing this all on their own because they've had all these years of practice by being here with this class and you. Um, visual reminders. So let's say I've got, remember, what they see exists. So let's say I've got a kid who's dying to be a pilot, and they are going to go to North Dakota where they have a good school, and they, that's their dream, okay? So you put a poster of North Dakota, and even maybe the aviation department where you actually learn to fly, I'm sure they have one with an airplane, and you put it in their room, because we're gonna build that bridge across time. So that student looks at that poster and goes, that's why I'm doing this little bitty five math problems, because that's where I wanna go. That's why I'm doing this right now, because that's where I want to go. You build that bridge across time and keep it in front of them what the big long-term goal is, so that they know why I do all this stuff that I really don't want to do, because it gets me where I want to be. Um, so you make visual reminders. Um, if you've got some big law, you want to make stuff fun as you teach these executive functions. I will tell you that fun is important, because we all make it. You can make puzzles. So I've had things, you know, we've got, got laminated um, uh, magnetic paper, and we've made a print out of, let's say, they want concert tickets, and that's gonna be a reward for something. So I'll print the concert tickets on this laminated paper, and I'll chop them all up into how many pieces I think it might take. And then each day when they do a piece, you hand it, and you build it on the refrigerator until they get to the concert ticket. And that's a visual reminder, I'm really working on this goal, and it's gonna take me a while to do it, but oh, look how close I am. And the neat thing about that, when you do that, is you, it helps them persist over time, but if they screw up and like say miss a day and they don't do the task they were supposed to, you don't subtract a piece, okay? It's very positive. 
So tomorrow's always a new day to practice our skill and get it right and do it again. So you didn't get your piece today, but I'll let you get it tomorrow. And you just keep that visual because they want it. You know, they want their concert tickets or whatever it is. Post-it notes when you want them to do something. You can hand it to them. Say, here's the things I need you to do. Give it back to me when you're done. Um, whiteboards, you can collect them in their room. You can keep them on there. You can even make a goal out of it. If, you, if I give you post-it notes to follow through on some things and I get 10 of them back this week, we're going to go have ice cream or some sort of thing that helps them feel good about the following through. And then you'll know they've got it when they ask you for that post-it note pad. Well, give me a post-it note pad. I've got to write this down. You'll know that that's all getting picked up. Time management, uh, picture of your life. Again, uh, your kids have planners that are great here, but I do believe at home you need a big whiteboard calendar. <coughs> Because again, you see it, it's in front of you all the time. And the trick is where do you put it so that they can't miss it? And it can be part of your Sunday night routine or some routine that they update and put that calendar together. So here's a picture of one. The reason that um, somebody's working towards a kid, oh, you can see that here. <coughs> this is for a little kid who I got like a second grader to eat a mint, you know, while they updated their calendar so it made it fun. But, and this is a high school gal that I worked with who saw this and said, what is that? And I said, oh, I'm, you know, they're working towards a long-term goal. Well, this particular like, young lady was getting to high school late and missing her first hour of class at the beginning of it, and it was hurting her grade. So she'd get a manicure, and she cut it up into six, six pieces. And when she got to school for the whole week, she um, would go get a, manic a manicure on Saturday. But the interesting thing about it was, this one a parent was giving. Okay, this is a, a middle school person. Parents gonna give them a candle for doing whatever it was. This is the shift you're looking for. This is a high school student with a job. A parent is not paying for the manicure. She is. And we all reward ourselves. One of the hardest tasks I have when I work with my kids is asking them to go home and write down what they can self-reward. Because true independence is I can reward myself. I don't need you to do it for me. I can do it. That's a trick, okay? So it's interesting. We all have them. When we work really hard, some of us will go to a movie. Some of us, when we get our work done, we'll take a bike ride. But we always do those things after we do whatever it is we need to do, okay? But our kids don't see us do that. They don't see us rewarding ourselves. They might see vacations that way because we've saved our money and now we're going on a vacation. That's why I work and do that. But this is an important concept of self-reward. And so it's interesting to ask your students, what can you give yourself that will reward you for your hard work? That's challenging. I, my, it's, it's challenging, but it needs to be done because it's a process that gets you to do it. Um, time management, you have to have uh, planners in college. You, have, you need multiple time management tools. Daily task lists are essential. This is the planner that I use. Your schools have given you an excellent planner that's very similar. But my colleagues could use this. The research says time should be broken up into 15 minute increments. <coughs> I can't find that, so this is a half hour. 100% of my kids will use this in their marriage. And there's my college kid, color coded, and she's busy. <laughs> that's what it does. Okay, internal point of performance reminders again. Um, talk about the difference between inferred rules and obvious rules. Because there's rules of life that are you not know, posted anywhere, like stop signs and you know, when you're in grade school, they've got all the rules all over the room, you know? And then slowly as we mature, there's, there's no rules anywhere. I'm just supposed to know them. Well, if you've got a kid with executive function delay or not, they're not popping up, they may not have those rules internalized the way they need to. So we have to uh, go back to their point of performance rules. We talked about modeling problem solving. Cornell notes, they'll talk about that in class, but that's for reading comprehension, so pay attention to that when your student does this. This is for when you want your child, when they've made a mistake. So we, the research shows that these kids, if you just punish them, it just doesn't work. You know, and I'm sure you've noticed that. It doesn't work. So what does work? Remember how I talked about effort equals learning? Restitution theory. Restitution theory is what you do. So, I'll give you an example. I had a student who their mistake was bullying another kid on the bus to the extent that they were not going to be able to ride the bus. This is a high school bus. So that's going to punish mother, right, who's going to have to drive this kid to school. 
but the mistake was bullying a kid on the bus. So the qualities of good restitution are it's tied to a higher value. In this case, this kid's not being kind. It takes <coughs> effort, whatever it is they have to do. In the case of this young person, they chose, we gave them a, a several things they could do, but this particular kid chose to go to a nursing home with their dog in the memory care one day a week for the summer. It, it, this actually happened at the end of the school year. Because writing the note saying I won't bully anymore, you know, doesn't have no. But that took effort. It's tied to kindness, a higher value. It's got a benefit. It strengthened them as a person to do that. It was a learning experience. It was considered a satisfactory event. So when you tell the school, or you tell whoever it is, instead of saying, I'm sorry, you say, you know what, I want to do something about this. I'm going to be volunteering at the nursing home, taking my dog in, because i got some lessons to learn about kindness. That hits, OK? They have to be capable of doing it. So you can't give them restitution. It's not reasonable. And it feels good to those involved, and respectful relationships are maintained. This is the book it comes from. I think it is fabulous. And when you do that, your kid learns. Your kid learns, it's effortful, and they become a better person, and you feel better for <coughs> what you're doing. Don't assume. Ask them what they're telling themselves when it comes to emotions. How extreme is that response? Is it appropriate to the situation? Ask yourself those questions, because that will give you some answers. If it is, um, uh, let's say a child doesn't, or a high school kid doesn't get invited to a party. Wouldn't we all feel bad? Okay, that's appropriate for them to feel bad. They may feel more bad, and you may have to talk about it with them, but it's okay, and we understand. On the other hand, if they tell you when they didn't get invited to the party that they're no longer going to attend school anymore, they can't go there anymore, that's not appropriate. That is an extreme response for something. They're going to avoid going to school. Now we've got more of an issue. If, if you see more of those, that's really when you want to call in a therapist to help you out because the ex responses are too extreme for what it is. The other, you get, you know, you would be sad, so pay attention to this. Watch for all or nothing thinking, and then talk through if not, and then we talked about the facts and the feelings. Many kids have what we call the positive illusionary bias. They're lovely optimists. They remember the last best thing. They do, and I'm sure you've heard it. How are you, I've had so many kids come in and I'd say, how are you doing? Oh, I'm just great, good. How's it going in science? Because we were really working on science. Oh, I think it's great. I got a B in my last test. It's wonderful. When I pull up the grade, this kid hasn't done any homework and actually have a D. But they feel good about it because they remember the last best test. So watch for this. It also happens in driving. Are you a good driver? Oh, yes, I'm a good driver. Have you had any tickets? Yeah, two. Have you had any accidents? Yeah, two. You see, the evidence does not support their theory of I'm a good driver. So pay attention to this, and you have to ask for this kindly. Okay, it's not an interrogation, but you have to increase some of that self-awareness so that you problem solve with it. So watch for the positive and ordinary bias. Exercise is so important. It's how we self-soothe. And when you exercise, you release a drug called BDNF, which is like miracle growth for the brain. So every kid I see needs to be exercising to get this stuff going. It also gives you control over your life. Heart issues, you know, all that. There's the reference for the book, so you can read about it. Self regulation, mindfulness, okay? Here we're going to see it again. When parents do the mindfulness practice, okay, and their student is doing it, the research is overwhelming, it's helpful. But here's what it does for parents it reduces your stress, it benefits all ages, it increases in attention, it reduces anxiety and stress in the home, you feel more in control, and you don't have, in, in either for the student or, or the parent, medication is not a player. That's amazing. So some of these kids who can't tolerate medication, this is a way, wonderful tool. So again, mindfulness. It helps you, you can read all these. Stressful situations, and it you know, fosters your relationship, I mean, just everything about it. Um, if you have, want to have some fun, go to um, Google and Google mindfulness and parenting, and you'll see nothing but wonderful research. Um, we talked about using rewards instead of punishment, what you do. We're trying to change motivation. When kids are young, you have to motivate them. They're not able to do it. For high school kids, they need to develop it. So we start kind of the mantra of, when I do this, then I get that. They say that to you. When I do this, then I get that. When I do this, then I get that. 
because that now that self reward list. Okay, can be degrade, but it could be something different. But you've got to learn to internally motivate. <coughs> Here's the research on motivation: frequent intermittent rewards, adults and children holding my positive rewards. We talked about that. Um, you have to be accountable to someone else. That's really helpful too. Um, and you evaluate the kids. Here is okay, we talked about the visual uh, representation. You always want to tell kids are really purposeful. Why am I doing this? One of the great things about the class that you're going to be taking, that they're taking, is they're going to give them the whys of why you're doing this. The reason you have homework is it solidifies your learning from the day. And when you learn, and then another piece of this is there's something called the curve of forgetting. So once you review something within 24 hours, it's giving a signal to your brain that this is important. So now your brain's going to start to toss it. It's going to start holding it. So reviewing homework is important for that reason. And your kids need to understand the reason you've got homework, it's not busy work, it's because you're going to be reintroduced to the material, and that's going to make your brain think it's important. And then you're going to do it again in a week, and that's going to make your brain think it's important. That means when you take your test in three weeks, if you've reviewed it three times and studied it again before the test, your brain really thinks it's important. So it's very, this curve of forgetting is very is useful. But it, when they don't know this, why am I doing this? I know how to do this. It's boring. But you explain it to them. Um, here's the motivation piece I gave you before. Here's your adult response. You've got those, so that's how you help them. And Minute Mysteries. We've got one minute here. Minute Mysteries are, are a game. You can Google these two, and it demonstrates what, mo what uh, reconstitution is. You get one sentence, and then everybody has to figure out what happened with yes or no questions. So my favorite one is, the music stopped and then she died. Okay. Now, all you can do is ask me yes or no questions to reconstitute what happened here. And so it's fun to play, but it also teaches what reconstitution is. Um, so examples of quality work, again, using the visual, ask clarifying questions, teach inference, uh, rehearsing helps with verbal fluency. These are your embedding questions. As parents, you can ask to help bring about so you don't get yes, no answers, that they have to actually give you uh, all kinds of information. So last but not least, before I let you go, I have 10 seconds, is hopefully, next year, hopefully, what I plan to do, I plan to write this winter a course for parents, including all of these things, once a month, where you can come and learn about executive functions, brain science, how to take that from a developmental perspective, what is mindfulness, how does it help your parenting, about the parent helping himself. And then wellness. What does sleep do for our brain? What is nutrition? What are all these, what do they actually do to us physiologically to make us perform our best? So this was fast and furious on executive functions. There is so much more. So if you want to come back in November, it'll be longer with a little bit more meat to it. And then this next year is really going to be really diving into it. It's like going to be like taking a class at the U. I mean, it's not you have homework. <laughs> so that's hopefully, you know, if you're interested. Here's a bibliography of books that I think will be helpful if you want to do some more reading. Um, this is the intro to neuroscience book at the U. So not to scare you, it's fascinating. You could, I enjoy it. So if you're interested in neuroscience at all, it's a great book. Um, and it's not texty, it's, it, it's good. Um, for mindfulness, I gave you these. I encourage all of you to <laughs> pick one of these and read it. I mean, this is excellent. I mean, they're just excellent, these books are excellent. And it will help you and guide you in how can you practice mindfulness mm -hmm. as a parent. These are some other additional resources. If anybody wants to see the ADHD, the, remember I talked about the delay if your child has ADHD. Here's where you can see where they figured out what it was. Here's the brain scans. They're fascinating to see. You can see that their brains are developing normally, but they're lagging. And I think that's cool. I don't, uh, yeah, maybe high school kids, I'd love to see that. You can decide for yourself. But it's really nice because the kids go, oh gosh, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm really going to get better. And the truth is, a third of the kids with ADHD outgrow it by the time they're 30, gone, okay? A third of the kids still have it, but they're managing it because they've learned the tools with executive functions. What do I need to do to manage it? And then a third are not doing so well. And you can imagine what that group is. The group that never got any training, the group in you know, impoverished areas, and they're not doing well. So you're not that group. So you can be in the other group and have
have great kids. So anyway, those are your additional resources. That's it. Go home, everybody.